Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for coming to this very special colloquium of the Physics and Astronomy Department at Wayne State University. Uh, please welcome uh, Vice President for Research, uh, Dr. Stephen D. Lanier.
been elected to memberships from several different organizations, including the National Academy of Sciences. He's received several honorary doctoral degrees, and he has received approximately two dozen scientific awards during his career, and most likely there will be more to come. Uh, Professor Thorne is an accomplished author of more than 150 technical articles and books for both the general public and for scientists. He was also a scientific consultant and a executive producer of the science fiction movie Interstellar, which came out a few years ago. So he's clearly a man of uh, great talent and many accomplishments. So today we're happy to have him here speaking to us. Uh, the title of his presentation, Geo Metro Dynamics, Exploring Nonlinear Dynamics of Curved Space-Time Via Computer Simulations and Gravitational Wave Observations. So let's all welcome Professor Kim Thorne. Well, thank you very much. Can you hear me in the back? Uh, it's a great pleasure to be back at Wayne State. Uh, as uh, you were told, I was first here about 1952, which is before most of you were born, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, I loved it here, visiting uh, Preston Scott, Elaine Scott, who taught at the School of Business. Uh, and so when I'm invited back, I try to come back if I'm able. Uh, the, and I should say, I turned down 90, 95% of all requests to give lectures. And so uh, this Wednesday holds a special place in my heart. So I'm uh, I was told this was a physics colloquium. So I prepared something to talk to uh, physics professors and physics graduate students. And uh, my slides are directed at them. But I discover I have a more general audience. How many people are not physics graduate students or professors? That's, uh, that's at least 50%. So I will uh, try to use my words to describe what I'm talking about. Uh, but uh, you'll have to forgive me for the details of my slides. You're going to get exposed to what it's like uh, to try to struggle with a, a technical talk. Uh, but uh, the ideas here are such that they can be grasped by and large by people who don't have a technical background. Is it possible to turn down the lights on the screen? Uh, if that's possible, that'd be great. There may, may not be anybody here who knows how. So my story begins when I was a graduate student, a PhD student of John Wheeler, in 1962 to 65. Uh, John uh, introduced me to the concept of geometric dynamics. By this, he meant how does space and time behave when they're highly warped? And it was Albert Einstein who told us that space and time are warped by matter and by energy. How do they behave when they're highly warped? And when the warping is produced by the warping itself. Think about that for a minute. It's like a snake eating his tail. Uh, how does it, uh, uh, well, you, you don't need them all the way down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm experimenting <laughs> here. <laughs> oh, that's good. How's this? That's good. That's good. That's good. Um, so, uh, if you think, uh, if you imagine taking a uh, child's trampoline, and the child stands on it and it dips down, the child does work on it to push it down. And so there's energy stored in the stretched rubber. Uh, it's the energy uh, that has been produced by the force of the child's weight pushing rubber down. Uh, and uh, that uh, energy then is something, according to general relativity, any form of energy will warp space and time. So in the same way, if you have space and time have been warped by some form of energy, that warping contains energy itself. And the energy contained in the warping can produce the warping. And it's possible to have a situation where all of the warping space and time is produced by the energy of the warp. This is what we call a highly nonlinear phenomenon. And Einstein predicted this kind of thing could occur, but we knew almost nothing about it until the last few years. 
this nonlinear effect of the, warp, the energy of warping producing warping. And uh, the challenge that John gave to us uh, in the 1950s and 60s was to solve Einstein's relativity equations to figure out how space and time behave when they're highly warped by their own energy and when that warping is highly dynamic, like uh, how the ocean would behave in a storm with, the, with uh, huge waves and frothing and so forth. What kind of thing of that sort occurs uh, in the shape of space and the rate of flow of time uh, when the warping is all due to the energy of the warping. So these, these are the concepts that we struggle with in this topic. And it is really, for me, it's been one of the most exciting, most <coughs> interesting aspects of trying to understand physics uh, in the, that I have encountered. And it was a big motivation for the LIGO project that was alluded to, which I will return to in a few minutes. But nonlinear physics, uh, where you have something like I just described, it occurs in a variety of places uh, in science and technology and everyday life. It is responsible for a very interesting phenomenon. So in fluids, uh, such as the atmosphere or the ocean, turbulence, the random motions of uh, high turtle in the air, for example, or water, uh, tornadoes, these are examples in fluids of nonlinear phenomena uh, that, whose very character is influenced by these nonlinear behaviors. What are called phase transitions in condensed matter. This is things like the freezing of water uh, or the formation of water droplets in the sky. Uh, nonlinear optics, modern optical technology, uh, the, uh, the optical displays that you use uh, uh, on a computer. Uh, a bright, the laser pointer here begins with infrared radiation back at the back end, and you wind up with green radiation coming out. How does that happen? That's what's called nonlinear optics. Colliding solitons. Solitons are waves that hold themselves together and don't change their shape as they travel uh, due to nonlinear phenomenon. And they, when they collide, they do very interesting things. And they show up in fluids, and plasmas, and crystals, and optical fibers. In mathematics, things called chaotic mass and strange attractors. These are buzzwords that uh, many of you who are not scientists have encountered. This is all nonlinear physics. And nonlinear physics that is responsible for very interesting aspects of the real world. We want to understand nonlinear physics in the context of warp space and time. But I'm going to describe four arenas where you have this geometric dynamics, highly dynamical nonlinear physics for warp space and time, uh, that we are probing today, both through numerical simulations and, we're, and analytic calculations of Einstein's equations. But we are also now beginning to observe with, gra with LIGO's gravitational wave detectors. The first thing involves gravitational waves. These are stretching and squeezing of the fabric of space and time. Uh, they are nonlinear self-coupling in a phenomenon called critical gravitational collapse. I'll explain what this is in a minute. The second are singularities. Singularities are the kinds of things that occurred at the beginning of the universe that gave rise to space, time, and matter at the beginning of the universe, or inside black holes, where space, time, and matter are destroyed inside black holes. These are phenomena where, uh, where space and time are highly nonlinear, the warping is high, highly geometric dynamical. When two black holes collide, they create a variable storm in the fabric of space and time, which is a geometric dynamical phenomenon that we are observing now with gravitational wave detection simulated. Uh, and finally, then gravitational wave observations, which tell us about these black hole mergers. So these are the topics that I will, will talk about here. So let me begin with gravitational waves and their nonlinear self coupling but I'm going to begin with something a little simpler. This is from computer simulations by a young man named Matt Chop to it, who was at the University of Texas at the time. He was a postdoctoral fellow there in 1993. He took a field, now the electric field, magnetic field are examples of fields. He took a field that's much simpler mathematically called the scalar field. Uh, but, uh, and he took waves made of this scalar field that all imploded spherically. So this isn't something that occurs in nature, but it's something you can simulate on a computer to explore this phenomenon. So he started these waves imploding from all directions spherically toward the center and asked what happens. 
that's what happens when the physics is going on, is that the, this wave has energy until the energy generates the curvature or warping of space and time. And then the wave interacts with that warping space and time and a nonlinear phenomenon. And he discovered something that was rather amazing and rather unexpected. Uh, if you put, made the waves have a large amplitude, I, I displayed the amplitude here by height, and I'm showing the wave propagating in toward the center just in two dimensions. I don't show the third dimension up here. But they, he chose an amplitude, a height for the wave. It didn't matter what shape wave he chose. Pick in any shape, the same thing happened. Uh, with some sort of height. If the height was bigger than some critical height, then as the waves came in, their energy created a space-time warping to produce the black hole, and most of the waves went down the black hole. Uh, and how big was the black hole? Well, it depended on the, how close the height of the wave was to this critical height. And the, black mass, the mass of the black hole that would form is P minus P star raised to some power. And that power he found just to, from numerical simulation was 0.374. And it didn't matter the shape of the wave. That was always that same parameter, 0.374, for the power, uh, for the difference, for the mass of the black hole before the height minus the critical height for that power. When the height was less than the critical height, the waves went in, they interacted in a nonlinear <coughs> manner, and then they started dribbling back out. And they dribbled back out uh, 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 in a uh, manner where the uh, wave died out in a certain way. And I build something, and this is only for, for the specialists, I take the so-called Riemann curvature detention that describes the warping space and time. I take its product with itself, I take the minus one order power and build something that has dimensions of length or height. Uh, and that scales as the height minus p star, p minus p star to the beta power. This should be p star minus p to the beta power, I'm sorry. But the same, the same power law. So the way in which the, outgoing, the strength of the outgoing waves died out, uh, the same critical exponent, as we call it, 0.374. Uh, and interestingly, the waves that came out had a strange pattern, but the pattern repeated. First of all, you had a pattern with something like that. And then after that pattern had ended, like precisely the same pattern occurred, but much quicker. Very shorter wavelength, shorter, very shorter, shorter time scales for the pattern. And then it repeated much quicker, much quicker, much quicker. So it's called discrete cell similarity. And that pattern didn't matter what the shape of the incoming wave was. You always had that same pattern coming out. Uh, and this is reminiscent of what is called critical phenomena in condensed matter physics. It was the first discovery with vacuum gravity, warp space time, uh, of uh, something resembling things that have occurred in the field of condensed matter physics. Well, a little bit later then, uh, several other people came in and did the same calculation where instead of imploding these what I call scalar waves, they imploded gravitational waves. And it turns out you cannot implode gravitational waves spherically. They don't allow it. So you implode them uh, with a pattern that is roughly spherical, uh, but uh, because of the nature of gravitational waves, not precisely spherical. Pick whatever shape you may wish for the wave, and it implodes, but it's a physically different phenomenon. The wave itself is made from warp space and time. It is consistent with stretching and squeezing of space and time, and an oscillation of the rate of flow of time. And as the wave came in, if the height of the wave was bigger than this critical value, born a black hole, P minus P star was the same as it was for this other scalar wave to the accuracy of the simulation. Uh, and if the height was less than the critical value, the rate at which the wave died out uh, was, uh, 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 sorry, what we really have here is the maximum uh, strength of the wave is dying out. So the scales is also that difference to that same power. Uh, and you had the same kind of discrete self-similarity. And so it didn't matter what kind of a wave you were dealing with. The 
as long as the nonlinear phenomenon was the curvature of space-time, and the wave is producing curvature of space-time, uh, you wound up with the same kind of behavior, a universal behavior. And this is really strange, but as I say, it mirrors what occurs in some other areas of physics. And it was our first hint there's a great richness in the uh, geometric dynamics and how it can behave, and also similarities with nonlinear phenomena elsewhere. These numerical studies are still in their infancy and more richness remain to be uncovered. So that was the first example historically of the early 1990s. What did it rely on? We were never before able to explore these things, but we had computer simulations, the first computer simulations that could be done where the computer technology and the, uh, and the computational algorithms were good enough to explore this. Next comes singularities. Some ancient history. In the 1960s, Roger Penrose and Stephen Hawking in Britain proved some theorems that said that the Big Bang at the beginning of the universe, there must have been a singularity where gravity was so strong that Einstein's equations broke down. And uh, the universe was born in that. It's something that's governed by, so by the fluidity laws of quantum gravity. And that, that really had to be how the universe began. And they also uh, proved that there had to be singularities inside black holes, where the curvature of the warping space and time was infinitely strong, so quantum gravity effects came in. And, uh, but they could not, using the techniques they were using, which are techniques from the field of differential topology of mathematics, they could not predict the properties of the singularities. What happens to you as you fall into a singular, singularity, for example? In uh, 1969 and 71, three Russians, Vladimir Volinsky, Isaac Kalatnikov, and Yevgeny Lipschitz, were all close friends of mine because I was commuting back and forth between the US and Russia throughout the entire period, spending about a month a year in, in Moscow. Uh, they did an approximate analysis using a variety of approximation techniques to figure out what was probably going on with these singularities inside the black hole. And they found, and I'm going to get slightly technical for a minute, that as you approach the singularity, say inside the black hole, uh, that the Einstein equations, which govern how warped space time behaves, so that your partial differential equations, they broke down into ordinary differential equations guys could solve analytically so that what was going on here, uh, if I'm falling in here and you're falling in there and uh, your uh, sister or brother's falling in here, you cease to be able to communicate with each other and you cannot influence <laughs> each other and what goes on in these different locations becomes totally independent. It's what they seem to discover in their approximate analysis. They found that what you feel is something called mass. I'm going to describe what that is. Uh, and they found that matter has negligible influence. Even though there may be matter there, you, know, you, you may be there, nuclear matter may, may be there, it doesn't matter. It, it makes no difference. But what happens if you approach the singularity where matter, space, and time are destroyed is influenced only by the warping of space and time. When you throw in any kind of matter you wish, it will make, will make a negligible difference. It was, this is quite amazing, hard to believe. And so, there was a lot of skepticism in the West. These calculations were not rigorous. They were very approximate. Uh, and they were the best that could be done at the time. So in the West, by the West I mean Europe and the United States and Canada primarily, and Latin America. But this began to be called the BKL, the Valencia Kalatnikov and Lipschitz conjecture. And the analysis was called heuristic <coughs> arguments. And from that period, the early 70s on into the 2000s, there was a lot of discussion of this uh, conjecture that this is how things behave, and these heuristic arguments that said that the behavior uh, is this strange mixed match of behavior that I haven't told you what it is yet, uh, and that uh, the matter, matter has no influence on it, that it is controlled entirely by the energy in the warping of space and time. So what is this mixed match of behavior? <coughs> Well, I'm making a plot here. I plot time here as experienced by somebody falling into the singularity, you or me. 
can a stretch and squeeze. And what space-time curvature does is space-time curvature produces tidal forces. These are the same kinds of forces as the moon produces on the Earth's oceans to raise the tides. And if uh, the moon is overhead, it raises a tide on both sides of the Earth. The ocean bulges out toward the moon and away from the moon. So the gravitational acceleration on the side closest to the moon is stronger than the center of the Earth. And it's less strong on the far side, so the ocean on the far side is left behind, sort of, and the ocean on the near side is pulled up. We call that a tidal force, a stretching. And the force on the sides is a squeezing uh, due to the uh, fact that the direction of the gravitational force is in, somewhat inward. So the sides of the Earth get squeezed, and you get low tides on those sides of the Earth. You get high tides toward and away from the moon. Well, similarly then, uh, what you get as you approach the singularity, there's no moon. But the stretching and squeezing are still there. That's what space-time curvature does. It just stretches and squeezes. And uh, so, uh, as you approach the singularity, let's say it's a galactic problem, let's see, concluded by approximate analysis, that you get different behaviors in three different directions. In the up-down uh, direction, well, we get a east-west direction. You get a squeeze, a little gentle squeezing, you become stronger and stronger and stronger, and it goes in steps. Whereas in the north-south direction, there's a squeezing, then a stretching, then a squeezing, then a stretching, then a squeezing, and it's stronger and stronger. Uh, and, uh, uh, and similarly, in the up-down direction, in the north-south direction, two directions stretch and squeeze, but one just steadily squeeze. Weird, but that's what the prediction was from the mathematics of life. And this went then in cycles. They, they stretch and squeeze would oscillate back and forth in those two directions. And then a cycle would end. And at the end of a cycle, the direction you stretch and squeeze would rotate around into some other pair of directions. So you may have been stretching along this direction. Now you're stretching along that direction. Rotates in some matter in some other directions. And then the whole pattern uh, repeats. Uh, and you have a set of cycles, of oscillations of stretch, squeeze, stretch, squeeze, new era, stretch, squeeze, stretch, squeeze in that direction, new era, stretch, squeeze, stretch, squeeze in that direction, over and over again, faster and faster and faster, until the stretch and squeeze are so enormous that they tear your body apart. And then so enormous they tear the atoms in which your body are made apart. And then ultimately your body, your, the matter according to general relativity is destroyed uh, and space and time are destroyed. What really happens is governed by the unknown laws of quantum gravity and form of singularity. This is the physical nature of the singularity that they can use. Uh, and uh, so we didn't know in the West, we, uh, I, I have to say that I had a lot more faith in these calculations than most of my colleagues who demanded higher rigor than I did. Uh, I had, I, I believed that you could deduce things without having complete rigor with very high confidence. And so I tend to believe this that my colleagues in the West continue to call this conjecture. And so a group of people <coughs> centered largely around Oakland University here in Michigan, Beverly Berger uh, and uh, David Garfinkel at Oakland University were the leaders in this effort, set out to test this by numerical simulations as soon as the technology and techniques Computer algorithms were good enough to do the simulations on computers to figure out whether this is what happened. Uh, followed then the simulations followed by some analytic studies. And those simulations in the 2000s, well, I guess it, it began in the 90s, it stretched into 2009. And those simulations largely confirmed the detailed conjecture. This really is how space and time would behave near the center of singularity. This this detailed singularity. Um, and, uh, but it, it also revealed there were some things that had been missed. The, the things that had been missed were sort of frosting on the cake. There were occasional sharp spikes in the behavior of the stretching and squeezing. And the uh, projection of how the direction of stretch and squeeze rotated from one side to another uh, was a little bit off. 
So there were some phenomena that then test. But the computer simulations were key to really figuring out with high confidence what happened. So now we have a pretty good understanding of what happens near a singularity. Uh, you, those of you who have heard the law of the asteroid falls in there, the black hole, through the horizon, there's the singularity, it gets stretched and squeezed in just one direction, squeezing the sides, and uh, it thereby gets forgetified. That is the technical phrase, forgetified. But instead of that, it's a, like a taffy pulling machine, you're stretched and squeezed in a chaotic pattern. This is described by a chaotic mathematical map called the continued fraction map. Stretch and squeeze as you go to see there. And with these strange signs, <coughs> these weird behaviors that show up only in the computer simulations. That's not the whole story, though. We only learned much more recently through, again, approximate calculations that inside a black hole there are three singularities, three different singularities. And in fact, two of them, not Mikhail singularity, play a role in the movie Interstellar, which uh, I, I was involved in. As, uh, and if you read my book about the science of interstellar, you see this picture in my book. Explains what happens in the story. So this is the shape of space uh, as it would be seen from a higher dimension, looking in on our universe. The shape of space around a black hole, the horizon of a black hole is down here. Uh, Cooper's, that is Matthew McConaughey's uh, uh, spaceship is falling into the black hole. And as the spaceship falls in, time down in here is highly warped. It slows enormously. So that everything, and this is the result of these approximate calculations, uh, actually by Eric Basson and Werner Israel in uh, Edmonton, Canada in 1994. Everything that falls into the black hole after McMurray's uh, falls in over a period of millions of years. Because time is so slowed inside there, he sees all that coming down at him in a fraction of a second of behind him, is the prediction. And it creates a sort of a shock wave of enormous stretching and squeezing. But it's a, a stretch uh, in one direction, a squeeze in two directions, it just go whoop and stops <coughs> very fast, according to the prediction. So fast, in fact, that Matthew McConaughey may be stretched by a factor of two in length, but that's all. He's hit the, he's hit the singularity, and he's not yet destroyed. And we don't know what happens after that. This was an enormous surprise. Conceivably, only stretched by 1%, maybe he's still hit. That's what happens in the movie. He's still there. Uh, <laughs> you, you see a spacecraft, uh, the Ranger spacecraft. On the so th this was a big surprise uh, in, uh, when it was discovered mathematically. But there's more than that. Everything that fell into the black hole in the past, a little bit of a scat a little bit of a scattered back up for Matthew McConaughey. And it comes up in a fraction of a second. Everything that fell in thousands or millions of years of the past, the tiny bit scattered back up, uh, hits him in a fraction of a second and produces a bump, stretch and squeeze, similarly, uh, that uh, he might survive. We now know there are these three singularities inside the black hole. We don't know if for, with 100% certainty about them or how they're connected to each other, how rare the chaotic singularity is. But the guess is the chaotic singularity dominates when the black hole is young, and these uh, infalling and outflying singularities dominate when the black hole is old. But uh, we are going to need computer simulations to answer the question of whether that really is true. Those uh, computer simulations are about to be mounted, but haven't really uh, occurred yet. Again, though, we're talking here about geometric dynamics. This is something that is where basically what's going on is the energy in the warping of space-time is producing ultimately the dominant warping. And matter may have triggered it that fell in uh, after uh, Matthew McConaughey did. Matter may have triggered it, but the energy of the warping quickly becomes the dominant thing and produces more warping uh, and produces the kind of thing, phenomena that I just described. But again, we're just beginning then to really understand these dynamics of warp space-time. So now let me turn to, for the rest of the talk, 
to binary black holes uh, colliding. And these are the kinds of phenomena that LIGO has been studying, for which there have been three announced discoveries, and 3.87 announced discoveries. <laughs> One black hole merger that we're 87% sure was really a merger, not noise in the, in the detectors. Uh, that's the way physics and science goes. You have, you're not 100% sure of everything. We're at the face again, 100% sure. Uncertainties are apart from 100,000, apart from millions of the others were not real. But the one that were only 87. So these binary black holes that collide are really very interesting. So this is a drawing that was made by an artist based on my own sketch of what two black holes might look like spiraling together and merging uh, as seen from a higher dimension where you can see the warped space like a trumpet part. This drawing was made approximately 1980, very early on, at the point when I first realized that the first thing that LIGO was likely to see was black holes colliding just this way. Uh, and we didn't know really what the details were. We didn't know what the details of the waves were. But we did uh, know that we would get waves that would go traveling out through the universe and that uh, we were going to try to detect uh, with these instruments that we were planning to build. The power output in gravitational waves turns out to be, and we knew this number uh, approximately, very, very approximately, for very true calculations, we now know it much more accurately. The uh, energy comes out uh, so fast and so much energy total power, the energy per unit time that comes out during the collision, is 50 times larger than the luminosity of all the stars in the universe in line put together for a brief period of time during the collision. So 50 universe luminosity coming off in these gravitational waves that stretch and squeeze space uh, in a fraction of a second in the case of the LIGO sources. And that's really rather impressive. That's it awful lot more power than anybody has ever seen come off of anything electromagnetic. So there's no light, there's no radio waves, no x-rays, because what you're dealing with here is geometric dynamics. The black holes are objects that are made for warp space-time and time. And the energy that produces the warping is the energy of the warping itself. That's the nature of each black hole. When they collide, the dynamics that govern them by the energy of the warping and produces the analog of a storm and speed. No electromagnetic waves emitted whatsoever, unless there happens to be a disk of hot gas in the immediate vicinity, which may be disturbed uh, during the merger. We have not seen any electromagnetic emission from such a disk of gas. The guess is that the uh, two black holes going around each other stir up the gas so much they just repel it so far away that it uh, winds up when the merger finally occurs, it's not close enough to be significantly effective. The details of the collision we knew, uh, going back to the 1980s, were encoded in the shapes of the wave, the gravitational waveforms. So this is a gravitational waveform that I uh, hoped we would see something like this that would be really interesting from the uh, black hole merger. This is, so what, this is what I drew in the 1980s, the speculative waveform. It sort of became the iconic waveform that everybody just showed in talks through the 80s or 90s and 2000s until we saw the real thing. I'll return to the real thing for the end of the talk. So an example of a numerical simulation, and numerical simulation, of course, were the key to figuring out what really was really going on. Maybe I should back up and just say a, a word of history about this. Although I was involved in the, uh, creation of LIGO and uh, very much involved in the experiment to the extent that the theorists can be involved in analyzing the sources of noise together with my students and proposing ways to deal with those sources of noise. Uh, the, uh, by and involved in uh, initiating work on uh, how you analyze the data. By 2001, the students I had trained had now taken over they were doing everything that I could do on the uh, experiment, even better than I could do. Uh, I was not no longer needed. But I became very alarmed 
Uh, I knew going back to the 1980s that we needed to have simulations of colliding black holes. That's what the thing that I was pretty sure we would see here the first. That we would not know, or we would not know how to extract the information the waves were carried unless we could do simulations and compare the shape of the observed waves with uh, uh, the shapes of the waves that were actually uh, that were predicted by Einstein's equation. We would have to have the simulations then to look at the shapes of the waves and understand what they meant. Go back to the simulations, back and forth in the simulations and, and the observations. And so uh, in the 1990s, I chaired the advisory committee to the uh, international collaboration of people who were doing, trying to do black hole uh, merger simulations. Uh, and I watched as they were hung up, and over a period of about 10 years, they couldn't even simulate the orbital motion around the two black holes around each other even once. And I start, started becoming quite alarmed because the experiment was moving along pretty effectively. And I could see the end of the side for the experiment success down the road, and I didn't see any sign of, uh, of lack of success in the simulation. So I left the LIGO project, ceased to be involved in day-to-day -day operations of the experiment, uh, to start an effort at Caltech where I work uh, to simulate collisions of black holes. I'm not an expert on uh, the computer codes to do this. I am an expert on, the physics, on, the, on Einstein's equations and on the underlying physics, not in the uh, computer simulations. So I built a group that was basically an offshoot of a group of Saul Nikolsky at Cornell. We imported his students and postdocs to Caltech and built a adjunct of the Cornell group. And uh, it then, and it was clear that in order to really lick this problem, we needed a pretty large group, about 30 people. And so we built a group of 30 people. We could not get federal funding to build a group of that size. So we fortunately got funding from a private foundation, Sherman Fairchild Foundation, uh, for a period of about 10 years pull this off. And by the time LIGO uh, was detecting gravitational waves, we had the capability to do these simulations quite rapidly with very high accuracy. Fortunately, several other groups also had the capability, though with much lower accuracy, to have the uh, uh, capabilities for the first detection. So, so it didn't depend entirely on us. I'm going to show you an example then of a simulation. It's a simulation that corresponds to the two black holes that have the masses uh, in the orbit that, uh, that uh, we uh, inferred by comparing with the observation for the first gravity detection, the one that was precisely uh, two years ago, called GW150914, came in in September 14, 2015. So this is simulations from our collaboration, the SXS collaboration, originally Cornell and Caltech, and now involves a number of other institutions that have joined in and it's gone on. Uh, and I'm going to show you first the, the depiction of the space-time metric, the geometry of space-time in the orbital plane. So I show you a diagram like I was showing you before. Here are the shapes of black holes you see from a higher dimension. These funnels going down here and here. The color coding is the slowing of time as you approach the horizon of the black hole. The rate of both time slows to a halt, where you will see black that's inside the black hole where you see red, time is enormously slowed. And the arrows show the dragging of space into motion uh, uh, by uh, the energy that is in these uh, emerging uh, black holes. And uh, so I'm going to go into slow motion, and as the merger begins to uh, occur, we're now in slow motion. And you notice you're going to get something analogous to a giant wave. That's the moment of merger, a huge splash in the shape of space and time. Then it went down and oscillated and died out. And it was that splash that produced 50 uh, universal velocities coming off in gravitational wave energy. These are the gravitational waves that we have. So that was very interesting to be able to do these simulations, do simulations for different sizes of black holes, simulations for black holes that have different weights of skin. Uh, for direct to spin. But in fact, we quickly realized that there is only a very small amount of space-time geometry is depicted in this. Uh, 
And so in order to capture what's really going on with the geometrodynamics, we had to invent some way to visualize the mathematical entity to describe the curvature space-time, something called the Riemann curvature tensor. And so I did this together with a bunch of former students and postdocs of my own that were at Caltech and Cornell and in South Africa at the time, John Burbridge, a brilliant uh, uh, woman physicist who returned to her own in South Africa to try to build up the uh, physics there. And so in 2011, we invented this way to visualize this so-called Riemann curvature tensor. I'm going to now explain this to the physicists, non-physicists, that uh, this uh, won't be very understandable. Uh, when you look at the electromagnetic field in physics, say in special relativity, it breaks down into an electric field and a magnetic field. But these, the actual nature of the electric field and the magnetic field are different depending on your reference frame. You move at high speed in some direction, the electric field can get compacted in a transverse way in a manner that you don't see when you're moving at high speed, for example. Uh, and uh, you have something called the electromagnetic field tensor that really describes the full electromagnetic field. But you choose a reference frame and it breaks down into an electric field and a magnetic field. And uh, then if you do the usual way of, uh, of choosing a reference frame, then uh, you have a magnetic field, say, that looks like the usual dipole magnetic field around the Earth. You're everyone's familiar with the dipole magnetic field. <coughs> Similarly, if you take the uh, something called the vial curvature tensor, which is really the same thing as the Riemann curvature tensor, when there's no matter around it, so I'm talking about the Riemann curvature tensor, it splits up into a so called electric part, so called magnetic part, and the electric part and the magnetic part <coughs> time, space, time, space components of this vial or Riemann tensor, or the dual, the Lemaitre-Riemann tensor, and then the time, space, time, space part. Uh, these things are symmetric trace free tensors. And what they describe, there are two different pieces of the space-time storage I'm telling you. The first piece describes these tidal accelerations of stretching and squeezing. So if I take this tidal field and I uh, multiply into it, and intentionally I can contract into it a separation vector between two free falling particles, I get an acceleration, uh, which is a relative acceleration, acceleration of this particle relative to that particle, free falling particle. And so that's the kind of tidal field we have to be a stretching acceleration between your head and your feet, uh, or nearing a singularity, and your squeezing the side. So we call this the EJP, the EJK, the tidal field. The other piece is the differential frame dragging field, or the frame drag field, which I have uh, two uh, gyroscopes, one here and one there. Uh, the space-time curvature through this frame dragging field it causes this gyroscope to precess relative to inertial frames described by that gyroscope down here to precess the angular velocity precession is the product of this frame drag field and separation zone. So I've introduced two fields for the physicists. A frame drag field describes precession of gyroscopes, and a tidal field describes stretching and squeezing. And it's not generally been known, but this frame drag field is a very important part of the space-time curvature. I'm just stop my uh, stop this thing. Beeping at it. Sorry about this. I should just turn off the sound. Okay, so now let me talk about some physics connected to this. If I have a spinning black hole and I uh, place my wife above the North Pole of the spinning black hole, it doesn't matter whether she's hanging there or falling freely, what she experiences is identically the same thing. She feels a, a squeezing of herself if she's near the North Pole of the spinning black hole. Uh, by a map that such that the acceleration of her head relative to her feet being squeezed divided by her height is so the so-called normal normal component of this so-called uh, tidal field, or and we call this the tendicity that stretches and that, that squeezes her. 
is not well known. Everybody thinks you get closer to a black hole and you get stretched. But the black hole is spinning pretty fast and you get squeezed and you're in the orbital. And you get stretched by there the equator. So if she's hanging above the equator or falling in, she gets stretched by an amount described by the normal normal component of the time. Uh, and in the green regions, there's very little stretching or squeezing if you're near the, uh, the black hole. Uh, we call it the region where there's strong squeezing, a squeezing tendex. Tendex comes from the Latin word tendere, to stretch. Uh, and, uh, and so you get a squeezing tendex at the poles and a stretching tendex at the equator. Now, these tendex lines then I use the concept of appendix lines. If she's above the black hole somewhere, there are these lines that are like magnetic field, <coughs> magnetic electric field lines. <coughs> these lines, like the electric field lines, reach out and they stretch her or squeeze her. These are pointed along <coughs> mathematically the principal axes of this tidal field. And they Strength of the stretching or squeezing divided by her height, the eigenvalue of this uh, index field, which we think of as a symmetric separate tensor. Uh, so mathematically, the tendex lines are the integral curve of the eigenvectors of the tidal field, pointed along the principal direction. The tendicity is the eigenvalue, and this tells you the strength of the stretching or squeezing. And uh, if the tendex lines tell you the direction of the stretching or squeezing. So you see stretch along these red lines, she squeezed along these uh, blue lines. And interestingly, the blue lines do the squeezing. They emerge from the south pole, go up going to the north pole of the black hole. And the uh, tendex lines do the stretching. They just point out more or less radial. So this is the character of the space-time curvature around the black hole. We call a tendex a collection of tendex lines that do a very strong stretching or squeeze. So there is a fan-shaped uh, stretching tendex. It's just like a fan sticking out of a spinning black hole, and it stretches you along in the radial direction if you're near, near the black hole or even farther away. And then there is a uh, poloidal uh, squeezing tendex, sort of like the magnetic field lines of the Earth that does squeeze it. Squeeze along this uh, this tendex, this blue and stretch along the fan shape tendex is red. Now you also have this frame dragging field. And we uh, define a horizon vorticity, we're borrowing a, a word for fluid mechanics. That the horizon vorticity is the ratio of if, if my, my wife is here, she has a gyroscope at her head and one at her feet. She looks down at her feet from her head, and she sees the gyroscope at her feet <coughs> going around kind of clockwise. Her feet look up and see the gyroscope at her head going around kind of clockwise. It's very much like taking a wet towel and you squeeze water out of it. If your right hand is going kind of clockwise to see by your left hand, then your left hand will go kind of clockwise to see by your right hand. So you have a kind of clockwise twist on the towel. Or you can do a clockwise twist on the towel. So in this sense, there is a, a counterclockwise twist of space uh, near the north pole of the black hole, a clockwise twist of space near the south pole of the, uh, of the black hole. A horizon vortex is a region of high vorticity, high uh, angular velocity of twist divided by the height of my life. Uh, and so you have a clockwise vortex at the south pole, a counterclockwise vortex at the north pole, and a spinning black hole. We didn't know these things until after the simulations were done, and then we went in and tried to understand what was going on in the simulation. Then extending out of the north pole of the black hole, there are vortex lines. And if my wife is up here hanging, she will be twisted around the vortex lines in the same way as a compass needle swings around and points along a magnetic field line. But what warp space time does is it causes her to twist around these lines. It's not the magnetic uh, needle is pointing, it's she being twisted. And a clockwise twist along the blue lines. Uh, and so here's the entire pattern of lines. There are these red lines, counterclockwise twist, 
go out like this. They go out to the North Pole, swing around the South Pole, and go back into the North Pole. The, counter, the clockwise twisting lines go out to the South Pole, swing around the North, and go back to the South Pole. Quite an interesting pattern of twisting around the Black Pole. A region with very large vorticity, strong twisting, uh, as we call a vortex. So the key thing for the rest of this talk is there's a kind of clockwise vortex sticking out of the North Pole, a clockwise vortex sticking out of the South Pole. Uh, these are like a tornado in the shape of space, but a tornado twists space in the city of the North Pole, the South Pole, the Black Pole. Now, let's get interesting. We're going to collide two black holes head on. There was this simulation, I'm just trying to show you some stills out of the this simulation, that forced us to learn about these vortices of tendency. Uh, it was actually uh, Rob Owen, who's now Professor Oberlin, who discovered these vortices tendencies in the mathematics after we saw the simulation. So I have this black hole with its red, its counterclockwise vortex of twisted space pointing up. This one, the blue vortex of clockwise twisted space is pointing up. I'm going to collide the black holes. They collide, they merge. What you see is the horizon of the black hole, the surface of the black hole. Now this black hole has four uh, vortices. It has, I guess I flipped it around. It, I had, it should have blue here and red there. And it has a blue vortex up here, a red one down below, a red one up here, and a blue one down below. It turns out black holes don't like to have vortices, four vortices on them. They only like to have two. And so if you put four vortices on, which this collision does, uh, you wind up the vortices fighting with each other. Uh, but you have these four vortices robustly sticking out here at the vortex lines and the twisting of space around the vortex. And I'm going to now show you what happens in the simulation. But right here, here's this blue vortex up here, red vortex there. Then it pulsates, the merged black hole pulses, now it's red, now it's blue, now it's red, now it's blue. The vortices exchange vorticity. They switch from being clockwise to counterclockwise. So what's happened is that their vortex, vortices, the twisting space, discovering when the black hole discovers, they discover that there are four of them attached to the black hole, they just refuse to be quiescent. They start fighting with each other and they exchange the direction of twists uh, in these simulations. What is happening is elucidated by looking at the vortex lines. When the black holes are merged, the vortex lines are reconnected. And so coming out of this blue red vortex here, there is vortex the lines that swing around and go into the red vortex on the back side. Coming out of this blue vortex, a uh, certain variety vortex, the vortex lines swing around and go into the, on the back side. So you have two <coughs> vortices wrapping around the black hole now, coming out of the black hole's horizon, going into the black hole's horizon. Now if you look at the what's going on in the black hole pulsation, whenever it goes green, the vortex lines have popped off of the black hole. It's in the process of doing the switch over to exchange vorticity. What do they do when they pop off the black hole? Well, it turns out they pop off and they wrap around each other and create something like a smoke ring, a vortex line. It starts propagating out at the speed of light toward Earth. Uh, and with each oscillation, you get a smoke ring of twisted up vortex lines propagating out. And as these uh, vortices, propagate out. Through what are some of the Einstein's general relativity equations, which look very much like Maxwell's equations in electromagnetism, the time derivative of the, uh, of the tendex field is the curl of vortex field. Time derivative of the vortex field is the minus the curl of the tendex field. This looks like Maxwell's equations for those who know about Maxwell's equations. And it tells you already immediately that as the vortex lines move outward, they will create tendex lines. So the moving vortex lines create tendex lines that stretch. In the shape of tendex lines, they swing around this, uh, this torus. And stretch tendex lines that squeeze swing around the torus in that direction. Uh, and these are gravitational waves. And in the next uh, torus that comes off, the squeezing is on this direction, and the stretching is around the middle. And then also, and these things propagate off into the external universe as gravitational waves, and this is what light is.
Now, who would have thought that there is something like this in the dynamics of curved space? Like you have physical structures, these vortices and tendencies of twisting space uh, and stretching and squeezing space. Physical structures, as physical as my arms are, sticking out of the black hole, that fight with each other, pop off the hole, embrace each other, make tar ice, small grains, they travel out where they become gravitational waves. We didn't know any of this until we had computer simulations. And this, to me, is one of the most beautiful aspects of geometric dynamics that we've learned about. Uh, if you have black holes going around each other, which is what we actually see in LIGO, it's a little different. Uh, as they go around each other and they merge, the uh, vortex lines from the spins of the black holes swing out like the arms of this, uh, from a curling sprinkler or the spiral arms of a galaxy. But they travel outward, these spiral arms, and they acquire associated tendex lines and that stretch and squeeze and they become gravitational waves. So this is what happens in the simulations of, uh, uh, of the source of black hole for this computer to see. Uh, and this is just the detail, the precise details of vortex lines and tendons lines. I'm going to skip over quickly and just say, also when the black holes merge, you have tendons lines of stretching space sticking out of the ends of the black holes. You have a fan-shaped vortex uh, sticking out of the middle of the black hole. As the black hole uh, tumbles end over end as the uh, collision is uh, from true orbiting black holes, this gimbal shape will tumble end over end, the tendex lines swing around like the water from the sprinkler head. And as they travel out with that swinging, they create associated vortex lines that are twisting around and swing right on the same kind of structure. And uh, well, at late time, I'm just trying to say there are then gravitational waves generated by vortices that stick out of black holes gravitational waves generated by tendencies that stick out of black holes that are virtually identical. You have two classes of gravitational waves, vortex-generated waves and tendence-generated waves. And then again, for the physicists, they have opposite parity so that you can have the, those from uh, vortex-generated waves and tendence-generated waves superpose, say, above the black hole and uh, be strengthened by that superposition and they cancel each other below the black hole, and you get a huge then amount of uh, momentum flux to the north and hardly any of the south, the black hole gets a huge tip from the beating of these two kinds of waves against each other. So this is geometric dynamics uh, that uh, is really very interesting to me. And I'll stop then finally wind up by saying, well, we now have simulations that are teaching us about geometric dynamics and vortices and tendencies out of black holes, uh, and we now have LIGO, gravitational wave detectors, which are capable of testing whether or not these predictions are correct. The challenge is to observe binary black hole gravitational wave forms. How can we read off the geometric dynamics, that is, the dynamics of the vortices and tendencies near the black holes? The answer is you identify the parameters of black holes, the masses and spins of the black holes that are colliding, by comparing the observed waveforms waveforms and simulations. And if you get excellent agreement between this simulation, its waveforms, its wave shape, and the observed wave shapes, you're quite sure that this, this is the mass and the spin of the two black holes that merge. You then go look at the simulations and to see what was happening in terms of importance and dependency. So that's what we're doing. We have waveforms from the collisions of black holes, wave shapes. Uh, it depends on the mass of the black holes, the spins of the black holes, and the direction of Earth. Uh, and the waveforms we have seen are awfully simple. I told you I speculated in 1984, and I hope that the waveforms would look like that. In fact, they are far simpler. It's very disappointing. <laughs> 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 it was wonderful we discovered a but they were not as interesting waves as I hoped. Why? Because it turns out the disturbances, uh, as these vortices and tendencies fight with each other, the disturbances they produce as gravitational waves, they depart very quickly from the black hole. They don't get enough time to really become complicated. However, it turns out that Eric Wan Yang, Aaron Zimmerman, and Louis Lake, a laser at the Perimeter Institute, uh, recently uh, discovered 
so that if you have a fat, very fast spinning black hole in the shape of space is like this, the color coding is flowing in time, the white is the dragon space being multiple vortices. But if it's spinning very rapidly enough, then there are modes of oscillation, then, then other put differently. As the waves are produced, because they have a long neck in the shape of space, they can be trapped in there for quite a while. Being trapped in there for quite a while, they can start to interact with each other in a nonlinear manner. And you can actually get an analog of turbulence, the kind of turbulence you get uh, in air, the air turbulence that takes you up in airplanes, uh, due to what we call mobile coupling. So if we can find observationally a final black hole that's fast spinning, and there's a, we have a shot at doing that, we will be discovering one black hole a day roughly by 2020 as a final we find one that uh, it's spinning very rapidly at the end, then we have a shot at seeing really interesting dynamics and a really interesting wave shape that comes off of that dynamics uh, due to the so-called mode mode coupling and, and uh, turbulence in the geometry. So let me just summarize by saying I've talked about five different arenas for geometric dynamics. And all I suspect is barely scratched the surface of the geometric dynamics. Uh, and I expect that as uh, time goes on over the coming years and decades, we're going to discover that warp space time is really far more interesting and rich than we now know, which is already.